That is the Rocker Jocks. A track or 25 minutes from Rivendale here on Kiwi. It's 11 minutes past nine. The Radio Waymo Breakfast. Live from the New Scientist Labs, Janine Young, NewScientist.com. Here joining us in Melbourne City, Janine Young's with us. Good morning, Janine. Good morning. Good morning. Now, um, a few uh, quickfire stories to get through this morning. The first one is actually coming from New Zealand, but involves some Australian beetles. <laughs> that actually weren't even Australian to start with, yes. New Zealand has an awful lot of cattle, and that's something that I think most people who live in New Zealand would realise. Yeah. You always think it's the land of sheep, but it's not. There's actually more cows than there are sheep, which is quite interesting when you travel there. Anyway, then, consequently, they produce a lot of... Uh, waste let's put it that way we tend to talk about poo quite a bit on this program don't we <laughs> it's a theme ongoing theme throughout the show that yes probably says something about it <laughs> however this is actually a good news story because dung beetles from australia which are originally from elsewhere from africa and the like are being imported into new zealand to try and take care of the dung problem dung is a serious issue because not only is it well you know a mess all over the paddock but as it decays it uh, it, it releases a whole bunch of greenhouse gases. Um, they account for, manure accounts for about 14% of New Zealand's nitrous oxide uh, emissions. Mm. And that's one of the nasty greenhouse gases. Uh, dung left around can actually let parasites and other flies grow in it. There, there are some serious problems associated with leaving you know, cow poo lying around. What dung beetles do, and if you've ever seen them, they're amazing. They roll the dung up and either just lay their eggs into it or they bury it. And that then feeds their brood of, of dung beetles coming on next. A pat lying in a, in a field can disappear within 48 hours compared to the month that it would otherwise take. Crikey. So these little beetles are the most amazing creatures. They're brilliant. And they're thinking that by introducing them into New Zealand, they're actually going to be able to make a really big difference in dealing with these problems that... that Frankly, you have with the amount of cows that New Zealand has. It is brilliant. I love them. You, and that has massive implications for, you know, parasites. It means you don't have as many nutrients running into into waterways, returning nutrients to the ground. It's all good. Do you know how big they are at all? Uh, very, there are different varieties. I think they're around two, three centimetres yeah. long. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're sizable, but they're not huge. They could, in fact, be smaller than that. I've not seen one in person. I've only ever seen them on television. Yeah. So my, my very unscientific concern uh, would be, though, that, uh, heck, they're introducing a foreign species of beetle into New Zealand. Um, are there implications for um, other wildlife? Biocontrol measures have gone horribly wrong before. Mm. Yes, that's what you're getting at. Think cane toads. Yeah. Think, oh yes, yes, we, we know about these things. Certainly the uh, the experience in Australia has been overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. They haven't had any problems because in dealing with dung, they, they tend to concentrate on the big soppy ones like cows because it's more abundant. There's a lot of it. Uh, I don't know how they go with uh, the poo of native species, for example, because you might be thinking that um, the germination and the like seeds need to be put through animals and then out the other end. Mm. Uh, but potentially it could actually be a benefit because if they're burying the dung, then it means the seeds are actually getting underground and can germinate. Hmm. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's gone wrong with dung beetles, and I would suggest that if there was even a hint of something that had gone wrong in Australia, New Zealand wouldn't be touching it with a barge pole. Hmm. For sure. Okay, next story, um, off to um, music festivals where uh, one of the biggest complaints uh, from a bad festival would have to do with the sound, and certainly... Um, you know, I've been to some uh, festivals where the band's been really good, but ah, oh, the sound so frustrating, you know, and it's really let things down. But now there, um, there may be a um, a solution to this. Ah, oh, there's an app for that. There's yeah. always an app for everything <laughs> these days. <laughs> yeah. Um, researchers are trying to take care of the really high frequency sounds that tend to be vocals and the like. You know, they sound really tinny. You feel the bass through your body. It's trying to rearrange your heartbeat, you know. I think we all know the feeling. Mm. But the vocals are often the ones that suffer the most. So what they're, they're doing at the moment is setting up a system where a mixer at the stage sends certain frequencies, usually the high frequencies, to an FM radio transmitter to your device. And what it's able to do is to be able to delay this signal just enough that it can actually hit your phone and it has to be done uh, through a different system because it can't be done through radio. Sound travels about a million 
times slower than radio waves. They've yeah. got to delay it to make sure that it arrives at your phone and your, therefore your headphones at the same time. Um, so they can actually put these signals together. You feel the bass and you, you know you can actually tell a lot about what's going on about the music by feeling it because it's often that loud. So by delaying those signals so that you actually have them coming at the same time as the bass and everything else, apparently through the, the 19 volunteers that they had at a Danish uh, festival last year, the signal's actually pretty good and the sound comes across as being quite clean. So, you know, you might yet see music festivals in the future where you have people sitting there with their headphones on and their phones plugged huh. in. There are potential issues because um, not every phone comes with an FM radio these days. Mm. So they may need to put it across to, to Wi-Fi or to a, the 3G network or something like that. Just another thing on the 3G network, yeah. streaming audio. Yeah. Who would have thought? Because <laughs> that's what we need to contribute to bandwidth problems. Yeah, well, that, and that's what, one of the main problems at festivals, though, is everyone's tweeting their friends or sending live video somewhere else, um, and, and so there's all this congestion going on, and you can barely make a phone call. Um, but that's, oh, that's really cool. That's really interesting. And finally, um, and a little bit of a cutesy story, I think, um, involving sleep and snails. I know. I do things about snails. They're things that eat my basil, you know, and I don't like them very much. However... Snails have actually taught us quite a bit about neural pathways, the way our brains are connected and the like, and they may yet in time sleep, uh, teach us a bit about sleep. No one's really sure why we do it. Um, animals, most creatures, certainly every creature that we know about, sleeps in one form or another. And this group in Canada has now worked out that snails sleep too, but it's not the kind of sleep that we get. Uh, there is a characteristic pattern that comes with it. They, they kind of hook themselves onto a solid surface and they find that in the end the foot is nice and, and relaxed. It's a uniform shape. Mm. Their tentacles are only half out and they, I love this bit, their shell is sort of a bit relaxed. You know, it's falling off a little bit. You know how you get droopy when you're asleep. It's that sort of thing that they're seeing in snails and it took them a while to work out that they thought, hang on, they might actually be sleeping here. Huh. When you get woken up from sleep, you know that you're a bit drowsy and a bit dopey and you take a while to get, well, I do. There are some people that wake up immediately, but I'm not one of those people. So they figured the same sort of thing might happen with snails. So they let them sleep for a bit and they can stay asleep for up to ten, tens of minutes at a time. And they, they tap them on the, the shell to <laughs> kind of go, hello, are you there? And to see how long it took them to respond. Yeah. Stimulating their appetite. It took them up to, you know, 10 times as long to stimulate their appetite when they'd been this sleep kind of thing, as opposed to when they're awake. So this is the first documentation of sleeping in gastropods. And they, they don't organize it around 24 hours or light-based cycle like we do. Mm. It's, it's arranged around two to three days. So these creatures are in fact sleeping and it's the first documentation of it. I think that's pretty damn cool. I want to know what they what they dream about. Yeah, though. exactly. What are, what do snails dream about? Or <laughs> well, do snails dream? I guess that's the question. Dogs certainly do. I mean, if you watch your dog, you yeah, yeah, yeah. see that they're definitely dreaming. The old, the old running in the sleep. Uh, yeah, maybe they're that's dreaming about uh, you know big juicy lettuces kind of thing. <laughs> I think they're dreaming about my basil. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Hey, those stories you'll find in the New Scientist magazine coming out next week. Also um, in uh, newscientist.com as well. Sometimes as well, the stories are posted up there. But Janine, we will catch you next week.